Thank you above all, Teresa. I know the timing in the middle of a general election is not ideal. Thank you on behalf of the college and thank you on behalf of the university, your university. What an extraordinary public servant you are, Teresa, and have long been and will surely long remain. I hope too that you'll come back soon here again when things are a little calmer, maybe, assuming that is that they ever are. <laughs> Brasenos was not, alas, your college, it was St. Hugh's. But nonetheless, Brasenos is a great college. So great indeed that the notable alumni page on its website doesn't even feel it necessary to mention that William Golding, writer, was also something else winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. So great also that my honorary fellow and friend, our friend, David Cameron, is merely referred to as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom rather than the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and architect, open brackets, accidental, of Brexit. <laughs> BBC will in the future not only stand for what you think it does, but also for Brexit, Brasenose, Cameron. <laughs> you know it wasn't a race, really not, but I still can't believe that the Mercy Foundation Lecture Theatre got there first, while the ifs, buts, and whens are still colouring the Brexit tapestry. Well done, John. John Bowers, our principal. Well done, Brasenose and the whole lecture theater team, particularly Julia, who's here, and of course, our own Frankie, um, who has been of enormous help. Thank you. Brasenos was, of course, one of the five first all-male colleges to deign or dare admit women. That was way back in 1974, coincidentally, Teresa, or perhaps when one thinks about it, not so very coincidentally, the year that you came up. It was a step, no, it was a broad and long overdue stride forward of which William Golding must have strongly approved. He is known to have said, and I quote, I think women are foolish to pretend that they are equal to men. They are far superior and always have been. And most men of reason would not disagree, although today some might. Most of us, I'm sure, can name one or two. Brasenos was founded in 1509 by two men, a bishop and pleasingly both for John and myself, a barrister, the first layman ever to found Brasenos, uh, to found an Oxford College. 1509 was an interesting year. Henry VIII ascended the throne. Catherine of Aragon married him. John Calvin was born. And Erasmus, some might think appropriately, wrote in praise of folly. It was also over 500 years ago that education, scholarship, and its dissemination, the pursuit of knowledge and understanding, the realization of human potential, the spread of opportunity and ideas, and collaboration, network, all these things that are close to my heart are the things that this place that knows has been doing supremely well for half a millennium and shows every sign of continuing to do so but even better for the coming half and beyond. Our foundation feels proud to have become part of its life and work, its history, its very fabric. But we also feel humbled. You begin by learning how to make money, then how to hang on to it, and then finally how to give it away. Thank you, Brasenos, for being at one and the same, the perfect tutor and the perfect cause. Of course, we feel humbled more than anything by the thought that we now, so to speak, share a billboard with the legendary William Stellibras. Some of you will know of Stellibras, but not most. So those who do, please indulge me for a moment or two while I explain. One of the great legal minds of his day and another barrister, the extremely British William Toulon Stellibras Swan was actually christened not Stellibras, but Sonnenschein, and was aptly nicknamed Sonners to the end. Sonners became a towering Oxford figure, principal of Brasenose for over 10 years, 
champion, if not creator, of its then decidedly, even excessively hearty culture. University vice chancellor, and very unlike John here, a tyrant feared by all. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that. <laughs> <laughs> His was a great life. His death, though, in a grisly accident, and I'm afraid was, whose anniversary was for years toasted in champagne by the college fellows, did not honor him, but it contains enormous lessons for us all. And it must be said for any referendum inclined prime ministers out there in particular. If you are almost as blind as he was, and on a rapidly moving train as he was, and it's after dinner as it was, think twice before you open any doors. <laughs> think twice and then take double care. Doors always don't always lead where you think. <laughs> Poor Steli Brass's funeral service was conducted by the new college chaplain, Leslie Styler, who had been appointed in mistake for another candidate. <laughs> this was his brother, Jeffrey Styler, who tragically had to go to Cambridge and became Dean of Corpus instead. Actually, not so tragic for me because I hedge my bets and have ties with Corpus as well. <laughs> Steli Brass's blind, blindness luckily contributed to the swap as R. Styler was a popular figure who stayed for decades, becoming a bit of an institution himself. So much so that Jeffrey Archer, another Brasenos alumnus, and we trust future Nobel laureate, <laughs> gave, him, gave him a walk-on part in his novel, Only Time Will Tell. Permit me to dwell on this a little bit. Only Time Will Tell, a proverbial phrase dating back as it happens to the early 1500s. And who knows, perhaps to 1509, and the bishop, and the barrister, and the beginnings of Brasdos. Only time will tell, an everyday kind of saying, but in a context such as this, and a time such as ours, a time that will surely fascinate future generations, an expression that gives pause for thought. Because the truth, as often as not, is that time does not actually tell, or not very accurately, or with much consistency, or at least not when by time we mean posterity, and by tell we mean judge. Take our friend Henry VIII, the plain truth is that he was a most intolerable ruffian, a disgrace to human nature, and a blot of blood and grease upon the history of England. This is not I who's saying it. It is the venerable Charles Dickens. Today, though, historians such as Alison Weir recognize that his reign contributed on an extraordinary legacy. He created modern Britain. Henry began his reign in a medieval kingdom he ended it in what was effectively a modern state. We are still living in the England of Henry VIII. A leadership lesson for us all, making and reading history are not one and the same thing. Now to a confession. A few, a few nights ago, I had a dream. A dream about Oxford, the city of dreaming spires itself, but an Oxford half a century after Brexit, and an Oxford subtly changed. As I often do in dreams, I began in the air, flying balletically between the city's landmarks from the Oxford, now the Brussels Martyrs Memorial in St. Giles, to the Eagle and Child up the road, now called the Boris and Jacob, with its famous old Etonian front bencher honored by the elegantly elongated pub sign, and then to the one man and his dog, Cummings Must Fall, encampment outside Oriel, <laughs> a la Cecil Road style. I finally came down to earth outside all souls as a strange yet familiar figure emerged in a velvet-colored tan overcoat and fruitcake fleck tie, puffing heavily on the Union Jack cigarette, a figure whom somehow, by some mystery, I knew to be the Regis Professor of Brexit. <laughs> then it was past the Radcliffe camera, now the faculty of Brexit, through sea upon measureless sea of tourists, and into the Bodleian, now the Brexit Library, past the Sheldonian Theatre, now the Graduate School of Business Studies, Brexit Studies, and onto Blackwell's, uh, Blackwell's bookshop, 
miraculously still with its apostrophe S. There, in the sunless caverns of its Brexit wing, I found myself leafing through the greater Brexit dictionary, 157 volumes. But still not quite at the end of the letter N. Nobody wanted to be poor was there, and no deal, and Northern Ireland, and Norway. Dear, neglected Norway was still to have its moment in the sun. So this is how it all finishes, I said to myself, an all-conquering, all-consuming academic hydra, a fiendishly tricky academic discipline with which to mold and torture vulnerable young minds, a whole new academic industry giving employment to thousands. Oh dear, I thought, is the Schleswig-Holstein question mark two? And I remembered the words of Lord Palmerston, the Schleswig-Holstein question is so complicated, only three men in Europe have ever understood it. One was Prince Albert, who is dead. The second was a German professor who became mad. And I am the third, and I have forgotten all about it. <laughs> no, history does not repeat itself. But yes, it sure does rhyme. With that, I jumped awake. And then I thought of something else. When future generations of dons and of students take their chewed pens and freshly sharpened scalpels to our time, tell your story and mine, puzzle over the people and wonder over the dramas of Brexit, the political drama, the cultural drama, the human drama, one of the places they will do so will be none other than the Mercy Foundation Lecture Theatre here. I believe I'm therefore entitled to give these generations a message. When you study us, do so with your hearts as well as your heads. And note that there was reason as well as passion and plain good sense and dreams of a better, more generous, more unified, and in every sense more democratic world on all sides of the Brexit argument, before and after and during the referendum. And that there are reasons to admire as well as pity or condemn us. Secondly, before you toast our passing in champagne, remember that vision without action is a daydream and action without vision is a nightmare. And that we were there and you were not, and that choosing between Boris and Brussels, sovereignty and safety, autonomy and affluence, Brexit, no Brexit, and Brino was more difficult than it might look to you now and that far from being <coughs> deranged, we were just earlier versions of you, which means in turn that to understand us and to any people of the past, or indeed of the present, and above all to avoid falling into the trap of condescension or arrogance or inhumanity, you need first to understand a thing or two about yourselves. My friends, if you want to plant for a season, you plant rice. If you want to plant for the future, <coughs> you plant trees. I hope and believe that the Mercy Foundation Theatre here is an orchard within a greater orchard, within an even greater orchard, and that all three of them will bear fruit for many, many years to come. Thank you all of you so very much for being here with us today to celebrate its first season. Let's have a wonderful evening.